So our learning goals for this particular area of the course are to learn and utilize directional terminology, learn the components of the axial and appendicular skeletons, understand and identify the differences between carnivore, equine, and bovine skeletal anatomy. Further to that, I'll also add um, understanding the different joints and classifications of joints. So looking at directional terminology, the reason that we use this specifically is in order to describe what we're seeing and where we're seeing it on an animal. So as an RVT, our role typically is when an animal comes into a clinic, we're going to have a look at the animal, do a physical exam, and start identifying normals and abnormals. And when we're writing up our medical records and describing this to the doctor to have a look at the animal, we have to be able to tell them exactly where we're seeing something that's abnormal. So we can't just say somewhere on the left side of the chest of this dog. We're going to use other terminology such as the lateral aspect, uh, medial, cranial, caudal, rostral, etc. So we'll go through this in uh, class quite significantly, but this is how we break the animal components down into directional terminology. So I'll just highlight here. When we are talking toward the tail on an animal, and we start right from the bridge of the nose, so right from the stout, if we're talking about toward the tail, we're talking about the caudal aspect. If we are talking about toward the head, we're talking about the cranial aspect. Where that changes is if we're looking at the face of an animal and it's toward the nose, we'll use the term rostral and we'll continue to use the word caudal if it's away from the nose and toward the tail. And then we move on, we have the dorsal aspect of the animal, so that runs along the spine, and the way I think about that is the dorsal fin of a dolphin. So it runs along the spine of the animal. And then we have ways that we break up the limbs specifically, so we have proximal, which means closer to the body, toward the body, and distal is the aspect of the limb specifically that's away from the body. Moving on again, so we, like I said before, we have dorsal, which is toward the spine, like the dorsal fin of a dolphin, and then we have ventral, and ventral is toward the, or sorry, toward the, toward the floor <laughs> when an animal is standing. So toward the lower aspect of their abdomen is, is ventral. And then when we break it into this plane here, our transverse plane, we can see we have lateral, which is toward the outer edges of the animal. And then we have medial, which refers to the midline. So medial, I like to think of as toward our belly buttons, if we're thinking about it in regard to people. And lateral is sort of toward our sides. All right, furthermore, getting specific once again to the feet, we have plantar and palmar. So plantar refers to the aspect of the foot that is touching the ground. And specifically, plantar refers only to the back legs. So the, the aspect of the foot that's touching the ground on the back legs. Palmar is the aspect of the foot that's touching the ground on the front legs. Now, a good way to remember that, find helpful, is palmar front legs. When we look at our hands, we talk about the palms of our hands. So it refers to front, uh, to, to our, our arms, which are the dog's front legs. Plantar. Uh, it's kind of lame, but I like to think that I stomp on plants with my feet. Okay, so a plantar is referring to back legs, the, the aspect of the feet that touches the ground on the back legs. Now to talk about the tops of the feet, this aspect here, that's dorsal. So the dorsal aspect of the hind left foot is what we're looking at here. So if there is a lesion here, let's say, so I would refer that to that as the cranial thorax, and it would be sort of cranial dorsal thorax on the left hand side. So what I'm saying is that it's more toward the head on the thorax, so the chest, than it is the tail, and that it's more toward the dorsum than it is the ventral aspect, and it's the left hand side, which is also really important. So the transverse plane cuts the animal, I know it sounds awful, but cuts the animal into cranial and caudal, that's the transverse plane that we're talking about there. Dorsal is the dorsal and ventral. And then the sagittal, which is here, oops, sorry, 
pardon me, sagittal or median, um, is into the lateral and medial aspects. So that's just another image to give you a bit more further in-depth understanding. Okay, so just remembering that proximal and distal is specifically referring to limbs only. And then when we're looking at animals, we always have to remember that they get their own left and right. So we don't mirror, or, well, I don't know if, yeah, we don't mirror ourselves onto them. So if I'm looking at the table, what I put, if I put my hand on an aspect of the table, I put my right hand down, it means that's the right side of the table. Whereas if it's an animal, they have their own left and right. So if we're looking at them dead on, of course it's going to be opposites. So this kitty cat's looking at us, I'm pointing to this ear right here, that's its right ear. Same with this little guy, this is Moose, he's my very special cat that I loved very much, who's no longer with me. Um, that's Moose's left ear, and this is how Moose used to distract me when I was marking papers. And this is another little guy, his name's Ringo and he was adopted from the vet tech program. He was really fabulous. Um, fortunately, he died a few years ago as well. But going back to this, uh, that's his left front foot. All right, so we'll get into talking a little bit about bones, as that's our main goal for today. So there are five functions of bones. I don't know if anybody's seen this Family Guy episode, but I'll always remember it. It's when Peter Griffin wishes he has no bones, and it's really weird and hilarious. So let's go into bone function. There are five functions of bones. Number one, support. An example is the spinal processes. processes support the cranium. Number two is protection. Ribs protect the lungs and the heart. Likewise, the spinal processes will protect the spinal cord too. Leverage, so attached to muscles. Bones allow us to walk, jump, and run. Storage, we store calcium, various minerals, as well as blood. And then there's also blood cell formation. Hemopoietic tissue in the bone marrow produces new blood cells. So that's why we'll talk about the anatomy of, a anatomy of a bone, but if an animal or a human breaks a large bone, they do have the potential to bleed to death because of that significant blood cell formation in storage. Mm -hmm. So then we have various types of bones as well. There are flat bones, short bones, irregular bones, long bones, and then sort of this miscellaneous or other category couple examples of flat bones and we'll get into all of these in a bit more detail. We have the scapula. So on humans we call it the shoulder blade. Uh, dogs and cats, horses, cows call it the scapula. And then a lot of the bones that make up the cranium, the aspect of the skull, so the skull itself, are flat bones as well. So we look at the parietal bones, frontal bone, they're all flat bones. Short bones make up the carpus and the tarsus, so they are the bones within the carpal joint and within the tarsal joint. And we'll go into the skeleton a little bit later on, um, but carpus is of course the wrist and tarsus is the ankle, if we're comparing it to humans. And then we have irregular bones, so such as the spinal vertebrae, the patella, the fabella and the navicular bone as well. And then we have these cute little guys, which are, oh, that's my desktop. <laughs> these cute little guys um, that are irregular bones. They're called sesamoid bones, as I, I didn't quite say yet. So sesamoid bones are found where a tendon passes over a joint, and they prevent the tendon from flattening and sticking to the joint. So sesamoid bones, you'll find various numbers of sesamoid bones, depending on the species, within the feet and for us within our hands. These are long bones. We've got an example of a femur right there. Here's our femur and here are two radius bones. And then we have this happy little category called other. And within that is this interesting bone which is called an os penis. And I'll talk about those bones in a little bit. So the structure of a long bone we talk about the outer structure and then the inner workings of the bone as well as just how the bone is 
uh, laid out in general. So when we're describing changes to the outside of a bone, just looking at an x-ray, etc., the ends of the bone are called the epiphysis, and then the shank of the bone is called the diaphysis. And then looking at our long bones, so specifically the long bone, there's articular cartilage, and that's cartilage that sits along the joint surface. There is spongy bone, also called cancellous bones, epiphyseal plate, red marrow cavities, compact bone, endosteum, medullary canal, yellow marrow, periosteum, and then the epiphyseal plate, which is a growth plate. So the spongy bone, like I said, is also called the cancellous bone, and it looks like it's, uh, sorry, it looks like a sponge, that's why it's called spongy bone as well as cancellous, and it's made up of tiny spicules of bone, so tiny, tiny little spicules of bone. The way I think of it is the game of pickup sticks, if you ever played that when you're a little kid, if not, I'm dating myself, but pickup sticks where they all sort of stick together and sit up one against another, um, those are spicules, so that, that's what this, the cancellous bone looks like, are just a ton of tiny little bone sticks that are sticking up together. And there are little spaces in between those little bone spicules. And within those little spaces, um, it's filled with red marrow. And that's the formation of red marrow helps reduce the weight of the bone um, without impending function. So that's the, sorry, the formation of the spongy, the spicules. And then it creates red marrow. Sorry, I'm totally going off on a tangent. Anyways, carrying on down, so the uh, cancellous bone is quite light. It reduces the weight, the way it's set up with its little spicules. Going down the way, we have compact bone, which is a lot heavier, a lot more densely packed. And then past, uh, deep to the compact bone, we have this medullary cavity that contains yellow marrow. So the red marrow typically creates red blood cells, uh, various blood cells, and then the yellow marrow is used for different aspects of the body and it's sent out to assist with connective tissue and create connective tissue throughout the body. The periosteum is the hardest part of the bone and it covers all bone except for the articular surfaces. So again, going back up to the epiphysis of the bone here, the articular cartilage at the top, it's sitting along the articular surface, that's the joint surface essentially. Periosteum covers all other aspects of the bone. Now the periosteum, it's really important to know that the periosteum is extremely sensitive to, to pain, to pain specifically. So when an animal is having anything done to their bones, whether it's resetting a a fracture or if it's drilling into a bone, um, whatever it might be, a lot of referral doctors will actually freeze the periosteum and provide a local anesthetic along um, and sort of bathe the periosteum with local anesthetic because it's extremely sensitive to pain. And I once had a cat scratch me in my finger and it hurt like heck. Oh, what was its name? Constantinople. Oh no, that was another kitty. Anyways, scratched me in the hand and it hooked its, thing, its little nail into my hand and it hit the periosteum of my bone. So it just tapped the periosteum. It was insanely painful. It just quickly tapped my bone right down to the bone and it was grossly painful. I didn't like it. Um, the inner layer of the periosteum contains bone forming cells and it's really important for fracture helium, healing. Sorry, The endosteum lines hollow surface. It lines the hollow surface inside the bone. Um, and that's about it. The epiphyseal plates are growth plates. If you ever look at a puppy or a kitten x-ray, it's really hard to tell if it's broken legs or not, if they have broken uh, bones or not, because their growth plates look so interesting on x-ray, and they can be really tricky to see. And that's, again, the epiphyseal plates. Growth plates are when it's cartilage slowly changing into bone as the animal grows. So we're going to go through the entire skeleton, and... I've broken it up into the axial and appendicular skeleton as well as the visceral skeleton just as a way to get your head around it a little bit easier or classify. I won't be too concerned about what belongs to axial, which belongs to appendicular, uh, but I think it helps some people when they're trying to figure out which is which. So the axial skeleton, one way that it was put to me is very small murderers have really small axes. 
that's one that way that you can help remember it if you're having some trouble remembering the specific bones. And within that, we have the vertebrae, the spinal processes, the mandible, hyoid bone, ribs, sternum, and that equals the axial skeleton. So again, I won't be too specific on which belongs to which section, but it might help you in your studying. So that overall is the axial skeleton, is what I'm saying there. Easier for me, appendicular skeleton, I think of appendages. So your arms, your legs, on a dog and a cat, just legs, those are all appendicular, um, or appendages, sorry, which equates to the appendicular skeleton. All right, axial skeleton. Let's start with the skull as part of the axial skeleton. So we have three types of skull formations that I want you to get to know right away. We have brachycephalic, mesatocephalic, and dolicocephalic. And these are various types of uh, skulls that are referring to the ratio between the cranium and the snout. Okay, so our brachycephalic, that's our pug-faced dog, so squishy-faced dog, Shih Tzus, pugs, Pekingese, um, Persians, Himalayans, anything that you can hear breathing about a kilometer away, guarantee that's a brachycephalic. These animals need to <laughs> not be bred anymore because unfortunately right now uh, people are really, really wanting that brachycephalic look for their animal and it creates massive problems. Um, actually, quite often problems that cause the animal to die earlier than others because their faces are just too squished. And what that means is that all that soft tissue that's involved in their mouth at the back of their throat is crammed within a very small space. They get stenotic airways. They actually physically can't breathe out of their noses. They can't regulate their body temperatures very well. I have a friend with a little pug cross who is so interesting, <laughs> the way he's bred to look. Um, but we went for a walk on a somewhat humid day, and he was blue within a couple of minutes, so we had to turn around. It's just not, just not meant to be. Anyways, that's my rant about brachycephalic dogs that should not be bred anymore, and cats too. <laughs> Mesodocephalic are your typical uh, ratio of cranium to snout, and that's your labs, um, golden retrievers, more or less, but your typical border collie, etc. Dolicocephalic are quite often the sight hounds and the collies, so really, really long sort of needle-like snout um, with a smaller head, smaller cranium. And then when worlds collide, so this was Brownie, I believe was his name, cute little Pomeranian who is a brachycephalic. And then this is Leia, my big beautiful meatball of a great Pyrenees um, when they met. She was a big, big sweet dog. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty about the skull. This is a nice painted skull. In our anatomy labs, we have a couple other painted skulls, which I find are really really helpful for getting to know the various bones of the skull. Now there are lots and lots of bones in the skull. We are not going to learn them all. We're going to learn the ones that might be clinically relevant when we're discussing setting up for an x-ray, how to capture specific images, things you might note on an x-ray that you need to um, report to the doctor, etc. So we'll go through the external bones of the skull. Now the skull is mainly flat bones, as I mentioned earlier. It contains or consists of the cranium and the lower jaw, so that's essentially the dentary bones. The cranium function is to protect the brain, the eyes, the ear structures, and then the maxilla and the mandible are to provide attachment for muscles that allow for mastication. And that, of course, is eating. So this is in your Colville textbook. It's a great chart of all the bones in the skull. So we've got external bones and internal bones of the skull. Now I did say that we wouldn't learn all the bones. There are quite a few bones that you need to know about, but look, lots of them are duplicated. Okay, two frontal bones, two interparietal bones, blah, 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 blah. So just need to know where they are in general on the skull, and then some of them have unique features that we'll talk about as well. Points of interest. Okay, so this is a good one to get to know. Oh, and I just realized I did not check that link to see if it still works. But this image in particular, as my students, is a really good image to get to know because this describes essentially most of the bones that we're going to talk about in the skull. And I can go through each of them with their interesting little components. <clears throat> 
Okay, so starting at the most rostral aspect, we have the incisive bone. Notice how I use that directional terminology just like that. So the incisive bone is what attaches the front teeth, so the incisors, to the skull. And then we have the nasal bone. I should just go in order. Um, the nasal bone is very small. On most of our cat models, it's missing the nasal bone because it's very delicate, very thin, and it often pops off of skulls. I'm talking about skulls that aren't alive. <laughs> they don't just pop off of animals. So the nasal uh, bone protects a lot of the, the internal structures of the nose, including the nasal turbinates. And when we look at our skulls in class, you'll see that when you look directly into the nasal cavity of the animal, you'll see these little scroll-like bones, these really thin, paper-thin, rolled-up little bones. Those are called nasal turbinates. And they are covered in mucosa, and beautiful soft tissue with mucus all over it and they help warm and humidify the air. They help moisten the air that's coming in through the nose. I'm just gonna take my shoe away from my dog. Just one moment. Thank you. She's creeping around the house stealing my shoes. So the nasal bone houses the nasal, ter nasal turbinates. I'm sorry I can't speak and that helps moisten the air before it's breathed into the skull. Um, going on, the, <coughs> pardon me, the maxillary bone attaches to the canine teeth all the way back to the premolars and molars, and it also contains a sinus. So a sinus is a small pocket within bone, and again, it contains mucosa, and it contains lots of mucus, and it allows that mucus to enter into the nasal cavity. So to keep everything nice and moist and humidified as it enters into the respiratory system. The lacrimal bone there is a tiny little bone where the lacrimal duct is located. And that's, of course, where tears come out and enter into the orbit of the eye. The zygomatic bone and the temporal bone create this large arch at the lateral on the lateral surface of dog and cat's faces, actually mammals' faces in general. In a cat, it's very predominant. And in a cat, we use this zygomatic arch as an easy way to pill a cat. So we use our hands along the zygomatic arch to gently lift the cat's head upward toward the ceiling and then um, allowing their lower jaw to relax and we can pop a pill in pretty easily. We also use the zygomatic arch a lot for examinations. So looking at an animal's head, uh, specifically cats, we, we tend to use the zygomatic arch sort of as a handle to their head, which sounds really weird, but it'll make sense when you do it. The frontal bone is a really big flat bone at the dorsal, uh, the dorsal cranial, well, the dorsal, rostral aspect of the head. The frontal bone is interesting because it also contains another sinus, so another pocket. And in cows, as well as sheep that have um, horns growing out, the horns themselves grow essentially through, not through the frontal bone, but they, they come out of the frontal bone, of an aspect of the frontal bone. So that being said, a uh, cow or bull or cow, whatever it might be, if it is dehorned on a very cold day, sometimes a little piece of the frontal bone will come off with the dehorning. And what that allows is an open sinus all of a sudden. So what these cows look like in the dead of winter is a cow that's standing out in the field and it's, as it's breathing in and out, that air is circulating in and out of their frontal sinus and they release steam from their head and it looks really strange. So the horns come out of the frontal bone, essentially for uh, animals with horns, and sometimes we open up that frontal sinus a little bit when we dehorn animals. Parietal bone and interparietal bone form the majority of the caudal aspect of the, the dorsal caudal aspect of the skull. The occipital bone is really important because that's what connects to the atlas, so the atlanto-occipital joint, and that creates a yes motion. So the atlanto-occipital joint that is um, created when the atlas and the occipital bone connect, when they are connected, they allow for an up and down motion of the head that is saying yes, 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 yes. Temporal, temporal bone uh, assists with the formation of the zygomatic arch. 
And then we'll talk a little bit about this area of the temporal bone as well, called the tympanic bulla. Uh, plural is tympanic bullae. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, sphenoid, I won't get into too much detail about. And then, of course, the mandible, we talk about the, um, <clears throat> this, the lower aspect of the jaw, has beautiful attachments for muscle, for musculature that allows for mastic or mastication. And, uh, of course, it houses the lower teeth. I can't remember if I just said that or not. And that's essentially it. All right, carrying on. So I talked about the occipital bone a little bit. Um, going back to the occipital bone, it has these two beautiful processes called the occipital condyles. And those are the two processes that connect to the atlas of the spine, which allow for it to uh, create the atlanto-occipital joint. And then likewise, I said I would talk about the tympanic bulla. So when we talk about plural, it's bulle with an A-E. And these house the middle ear organelles, which are really interesting, the tiny little organelles within the ear. Really, really, really important. And on certain skulls, you'll see, see quite large tympanic bulle, um, such as guinea pigs, and it all depends on the acuteness of their hearing. So oftentimes, if they have a more developed sense of, of in auditory sense, so a sense of hearing, then they'll have a highly developed tympanic bulla in order to house their inner ear or their um, middle ear organelles. This big hole in the skull is called the foramen magnum, and that, of course, is where the spinal cord exits the skull and enters into the vertebrae. One thing that can go wrong with that is called chiari, like formation, i.e. scratchers syndrome, and that is a disease most often of um, brachycephalic dogs, quite often King Charles Cavalier Spaniel, whereby the brain is essentially too big for the cranium. So it starts to create um, inflammation and tissue being pushed crowding the foramen magnum and crowding the spinal cord, and they start to get a strange neurological itchy sensation in the back of their head, and there's nothing there to cause it. So these poor little dogs will be scratching and scratching and scratching the back of their head like crazy, and it's because they have a neurological problem that needs to be fixed. Um, was there anything else I was going to say? I believe that's it. Oh, yes. Uh, no, that's fine. That's good enough. Okay, a little bit of a review. What is the difference between cancellous and compact bone? Provide a breed example of brachycephalic, mesatocephalic, and dolicocephalic type head shapes. What is one important feature of the following bones in the skull? And that's the tympanic bullae, occipital condyles, foramen magnum, and maxilla and frontal bone. All right, carrying on with the axial skeleton. So this is another little one. It's an, actually it's not so much one bone. It's called the hyoid apparatus. And I'd like you to get to know what it's all about. You can read it up in your textbook. And then we're going to move on to spinal processes. So here's a weird little formulae, a whole bunch of formulae that I'm going to give you. So carnivore, C7, T13, L7, S3, CD5 to 20. Equine, C7, T18, L5 to 6, S5, CD15 to 21. Bovine, C7, T13, L5, S5, CD16 to 18. What the heck does this mean? Well, when we open up those words, it means carnivore, cervical, 7, thoracic, 13, lumbar, 7, sacral, 3, caudal or coccygeal, 5 to 20. And what the heck is this? Well, this identifies the various sections of the spinal processes and how many individual vertebrae are in each section of the spinal column. So we have a cervical section, a thoracic section, <clears throat> a lumbar section, sacral section, and a coccygeal section. And then this is telling us exactly how many vertebrae are within each of those sections for carnivore, equine, and bovine. 
So just going back, you as a student will definitely want to get to know this. Now, let's just show you here how it looks. So we've got our skull, and then we have seven cerv cervical vertebrae. We have 13 thoracic vertebrae, seven lumbar, three sacral, and then caudal, the proper term is coccygeal, is five to 20. Why the heck do we need to know how many numbers of vertebrae are in each specific section of the, the spine? So really important for a few reasons. Um, we always need to know normals in order to know our abnormals. So again, if an animal is born with a, some sort of congenital defect, etc. Also, when we are performing radiographs as an RVT, registered vet tech, our job is definitely to set an animal up for x-rays and take the x-rays. And we want to be able to count the various sections of the spine to ensure that we have the vertebrae in there that the doctor is requesting. Okay, so for me, that's typical number one. Number two, a doctor often uses uh, accounting, so counting whether it's on x-ray or physically by, ha by hand, the cervical number, or not cervical number, sorry, the vertebrae number. So calling it C3 would be cervical vertebrae vertebra number three. And the reason they'll do that is to indicate specifically where they see an injury. So maybe they'll say between C6 and C7. So that might be on an x-ray or where an animal is sensitive if they're walking their hands up their back, sort of palpating the spine as they go. They'll be able to say between L1, T13, that's where they start to get sensitive. We also use it when we, either as RVTs or when the doctors are giving epidurals. And a local anesthetic goes in between the epidural space, between two specific vertebrae. They need to be able to landmark those specific vertebrae. All right, and then here's looking at the equine vertebrae. So again, cervical, they have seven. Thoracic, they have 18. Lumbar, five to six, depending on the breed. Sacral, they have five. And then they have 15 to 21 coccygeal. And then likewise with the bovine as well. Okay, so then we'll look at each individual um, spinal vertebra. So when we're talking about one, we're saying vertebra. When we're talking about plural, it's vertebrae, A-E. So the anatomy of a spinal process or a spinal vertebra we have the spinous process, the cranial articular process, the caudal articular process, the arch, the body, the vertebral foramen, and the transverse process. Now, these specifically, I don't need you to go into extremely high levels of knowing the anatomy of a, of a spinal process. I just need you to be able to know what I'm talking about. So if I say it has an elongated transverse process, or it has an elongated spinous process, hint, hint, those are the two that I'll use all the time, then you get to know what I'm talking about. But this is the general anatomy of a spinal process. So the vertebrae are separated by intervertebral discs made of fibrocartilage on the outside and gel on the inside. The spinal cord runs down the center of the vertebrae through the vertebral foramen and the atlas and axis are unique to ensure appropriate support for the cranium. And we'll get into those two uh, right now. So remember how I was saying that the various areas of the spine have specific numbers of vertebrae within them. So the very first, the most cranial aspect of the spine is called the cervical spine. And it has seven vertebrae within it. And that's for everybody. That's every mammal ever has seven vertebrae. A giraffe, they have seven very large vertebrae. So the first two vertebrae are very unique, different than any other vertebrae in the body. And it's specifically to allow for a yes and no movement of the head, as well as supporting the cranium, as it's the most vital part of the body. So the very first cervical vertebra C1, or cervical vertebra 1, is also called the atlas. 
And in the textbook, it identifies the Atlas was named because of the Greek god who held the globe over his head, the world over his head. So you think about the Atlas holding the globe over, it, over itself, so holding the brain over itself. So it's the very first cervical vertebra. And the Atlas to me looks like a weird little butterfly or a stingray, however you want to picture it, but definitely a butterfly in my head. And when you pick up your cat next time, or if you have a dog that doesn't have a giant muscular neck, just pet them behind the back of the skull and then down to their neck and right behind the skull, so right just caudal to the skull, you should be able to feel these two processes sticking out laterally on either side. And that is the atlas. The axis is also very different. It has a dens, which is this small process that connects to the atlas, and it also has this very large axe-like axe -like, um, transverse process, or spinous process, which is unlike any other vertebrae in the body. So that being said, when the atlas connects to the skull, so when it connects to the occipital condyles, it allows the head to make to bob up and down, and that's a yes a yes motion that it's able to make. So if you do a yes with your head, that's what the atlanto-occipital joint um, allows for motion-wise. The axis connects with the atlas and allows the head to swivel the other way, allowing for a no type movement, which I think is kind of cool. Now, a couple ways that you can remember which one's which, because we've got the atlas and the axis, and one of them is C1, one of them is C2. The, for me, it works best that the atlas comes before the axis in the dictionary. Alphabetical, for me, works best. And then this is something that you'd probably get on a test. Hint, hint, nod, nod. I use this for testing all the time. So this is the cervical spine. This is an, a radiograph of the cervical spine. And it identifies when we would start to use sort of that counting mechanism to identify areas on the spine. So this is cervical vertebra one, also called the atlas, cervical vertebra two, called the axis, and you can see that big overhanging spinous process, and then cervical vertebra three, cervical vertebra four, all the way down, six, and then seven. And seven, in fact, is covered up by the scapula, so it's difficult to see seven. Thoracic spine. Now, the thoracic vertebrae we'll talk about in class. They are significantly different in many ways from other vertebrae. They look extremely unique. They have this immense transverse, nope, I lied. They have this immense spinous process, really immense spinous process. And there's a certain, I gotta look up what kind of dinosaur this is that's in my head, but there's a certain dinosaur that these guys always remind me of, and it's got this big thing on the back of its head. I'll look it up, I'll bring it to class, hopefully. So the thoracic vertebrae are very different. They have really short transverse processes on the sides, and then they have a really long spinous process. And we'll talk about that in class, but that's mainly to attach to significant amounts of muscle up near the shoulder, and then around through the ribs and the abdominal muscles as well or not so much the, well, toward the abdominal muscles, but definitely the shoulders and uh, through the ribs. Lumbar muscle, or lumbar vertebrae, um, nothing particularly spectacular about the looks of these. One thing that is different in some areas of the lumbar vertebrae are their significant transverse processes. Okay, so the side processes here, transverse processes. And they are typically much more extensive than the spinous process in the lumbar vertebrae because, again, they attach to muscle. So they really attach to all that abdominal muscle, that really cool abdominal muscle. And you can see those transverse processes here just sticking out in the x-ray. Just going to go back to thoracic, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but just to note that within each thoracic vertebra, ribs articulate. So ribs will create a joint with thoracic vertebrae. So the sacral and coccygeal, AA, AKA the caudal. So I like the term coccygeal. I feel it's a little bit more anatomically correct. You'll sometimes see it noted as caudals, um, but coccygeals is what I'll typically use. 
So we have the sacrum is A and B is the caudal vertebrae. So the sacrum is fused and I think, yep, we'll go into that next. So the sacrum is made up of various sacral vertebrae, but they're fused together to create one big uh, plate, one big bone plate. So they're unique in that sense. And dog and cat, um, these are not dog and cat, these are definitely cow, but they are all fused in mammals, the, the sacrum. And for us, no, I was going to say something that did not make sense. Ignore it. Um, but as they get down toward the tail, when we're talking about the coccygeal vertebrae, they're going to vary in number depending on the breed of animal that it is, depending on whether or not they've had their tails docked, or just whether or not that breed was born without a long tail. So they can vary quite significantly. That being said, it's important to know that when a tail is being docked on a puppy or a kitten or horse or cow or lamb, um, in general it is, now I say lamb, but they're done typically a little bit differently, but let's say it's a puppy or a kitten that a tail is being docked, it is really disarticulating two bones, so it's cutting between two bones, um, you're cutting the tail off between two bones. So there are some complications that can happen. Number one, it's painful. Don't ever let a vet or anybody, I say a vet because it happened to me, but don't let anybody tell you that um, cutting a puppy's tail off <laughs> when it's newborn is not painful. It's terribly painful. They have uh, significant nerve endings within that tail area. Um, so that's one point to always keep in mind when you're an RVT in the field, that it is painful, and if it's being done, definitely local anesthetic or more should be used. And then number two, if it's being done, even if it's for like a medical reason, not so much an aesthetic reason, it's really important, and the vet would know this, to ensure disarticulation so that the, the incisions being made in between two bones and not taking a piece of one bone and leaving a piece of a bone. Because if you split a bone, then you've got open nerves and um, potential blood supply, but definitely open nerves that can be extremely painful as that animal gets older. All right, review. List the verte vertebral, vertebral sorry, formulae for carnivore, equine, and bovine. C1 and C2 are also known as what? The atlanto-occipital joint is responsible for which head movement? And what the heck is the purpose of the hyoid bone? Ribs. All right, moving on. Let's talk a little bit about ribs. So the ribs, their overall goal is to protect the thoracic cavity. And then they also allow for muscle attachment and um, various attachments to allow for breathing. So to allow for inhalation and uh, exhalation. Each rib has um, a bony part and a cartilaginous area. So I like this image. This is the ventral aspect. Okay, so right here we're looking at the sternum, which I'll talk about in a moment. And this is the cartilage that's attached to the sternum. So each rib starts off as bone. Okay, this is the dorsal aspect. It's the head of the rib. It's all bone, all bone, all bone. And as it works its way, uh, ventrally it turns into costal cartilage and that cartilage connects to the sternum and that allows for some flexibility within the ribs and that does vary by species as well but typically um, definitely carnivore we've got beautiful cartilaginous ribs about uh, two-thirds of the way down so the where the bone and the cartilage meets right here is called the costochondral junction Okay, I will definitely ask you that on a test at some point. And rib pairs, um, oh no, wait, what was I going to say? Nope, that's it. Uh, <laughs> so carnivores have 13 ribs. Uh, equine has 18. And we have this costal arch. So we have, let's count them, starting from cranial. So this is where the head would be up here. And then this is caudal. We have rib one, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Now, what do you notice about 13, 12, 11, 10, um, and that's it. So those ribs in particular create this costal arch, so they are linked together and held together via cartilage, whereas the others, the cartilage actually connects into the sternum itself. So it's just something to note. Um, 
No, I was going to go back to... Oh, yeah. Sneaky trick. Technically, technically, there are 26 rooms. Not 13, because there are two of each. Just be aware of that. But I'll, I'll accept 13. That's accepted as 13 pairs. So the 13th rib on carnivores is called the floating rib. And it's sort of like a little half rib or a third of a rib. It ends abruptly. And you can feel it. So we typically use that. Again, why do we need to know the numbers of the ribs? Because they are literally labeled rib 1 all the way through to rib 13 on the left and right side. We use that often for landmarking. So it's really important for us as RVTs to be able to count ribs on dogs and cats, at least, if not horses and cows, in order to count backwards. Because I'll go into that in a minute, but we count backwards from 13 toward the cranial aspect to start landmarking for various procedures. So various procedures that we might be landmarking for could be for placement, appropriate placement of a feeding tube. So how far the feeding tube, how far we should measure the feeding tube to go in. Um, for cardiac injection, so which is often a euthanasia. And also where to place the stethoscope. Okay, so where to specifically find the heart on the animal's body. So that being said, when we're counting ribs, and I'll show you this in class because it's really hard to describe without showing you with my hands, but we count from the caudal aspect up toward the cranial aspect because the cranial ribs up here are covered by their scapula on either side as well as heaps of muscle. So we really can only count up to about rib four, rib three, four. Okay, so we'll start with 13, and then we sort of tickle the animal as we count from caudal to cranial. Oh, I'll just get back into this, because apparently I just tried to shut my computer down. All right. I also just wanted to point out, I was talking earlier about the little joint that the rib creates with the thoracic vertebra. So see here the head of the rib? right here, sorry, and the tubercle, which is another process, projection of the rib bone, create this cute little, okay, it's not that cute, but it is kind of cute, a cute little joint, so an articulation with the thoracic vertebrae, the various thoracic vertebrae. All right, this is the sternum. So if we go back to the other picture, this is how the sternum is truly laid out. This is the cranial aspect, this is the caudal. So again, this is cranial, caudal, <clears throat> and in carnivores, there are eight sternobrae. Now, in carnivores, the sternobrae are not fused together, whereas bovine, equine, they're fused together to form one big bone plate. So here is our sternum, which is made up of eight little sternobrae, so eight little bones. So again, we count... In this case, we're going to count and label them from cranial to caudal. So this is sternobra number one, sternobra two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, other names for these, we have the most cranial sternobra is also called the manubrium. And the most caudal sternobra is also called the xiphoid. And the manubrium, clinical significance, the manubrium we often can feel on dogs and cats, again, as long as they're not heavily muscled in that thoracic girdle area. We can often feel the manubrium, and if we can touch the manubrium, we place our thumb to the left or right of it, and that's our landmarking that we use for jugular withdrawal. The xiphoid, on the other hand, um, extending from the xiphoid is what's called the xiphoid cartilage, and we can feel that in some animals as well. And the xiphoid cartilage attaches to the linea alba, which is a large piece of connective tissue that attaches right down to the pelvis. Um, we often use it for landmarking, for shaving, for abdominal surgeries. And then I'll talk about the linea alba in lectures to come. Appendicular skeleton, what does that mean? We're talking about the appendages. So we've got the front limbs that include the scapula or scapulae if it's uh, plural, humerus, radius, ulna, carpus, metacarpal bones, and phalanges. And know the difference between canine and large animal because they vary significantly. So looking at fluffy here, we've got the scapula, 
and we have, uh, you can see on the scapula, it's a nice big flat bone, and then we have the spine of the scapula runs down the center of the bone, and that again is another process that allows for massive muscle attachment around the shoulder, the scapula. We have the humerus, the olecranon process, definitely get to know that one. It's the elbow, okay? We don't call it the elbow with uh, animals, we call it the... Well, we, uh, I lied. I totally just lied. We often do call it the elbow. I'm sorry. But it's the olecranon process that attaches to a lot of the musculature to allow flexion, flexion and extension of that leg. So olecranon process is this. You can see it really well here. That's the olecranon process. Okay, and it's actually the point of the ulna. So it's the dorsal most aspect of, or the proximal most aspect of the ulna. And this is the ulna here. So here's the ulna. And then the radius sits um, essentially cranial to the ulna, sort of sits on top of the ulna, and that creates a lower forelimb. And then we have the carpals, which is the carpus joint, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. We'll work our way back. We've got the pelvis, we've got the femur, the patella is the kneecap, um, and then we have the fibia. Note the tibia, sorry, the fibula. Note the spelling, tibia, fibula. And together, the femur, the patella, and the tibia create the stifle joint. And on us, it's called the knee joint. Then we go down, we've got the tibia fibula, as I said. The tarsals are the tarsal bones, also known as the tarsal joint, so i.e. the ankle on humans. And the calcaneum on us is our heel. So and it's, it's an extension of a metacar metatarsal bone. So calcaneus is something that we use on dogs and cats as a landmarking. Calcaneus or calcaneum is entirely acceptable. How it varies on horses and on cows is, of course, at the distal aspect of their joints, they only have one to two toes. So horses have one, cows have two. Also, on these big guys, the metacarpal bones are fused and the metatarsal bones are fused. The tibia and fibula are fused as well as the radius and ulna are fused. Likewise, going back to the ribs, um, the sternum is fused as well. Okay, so here's an example of an equine front limb. So we've got the scapula, uh, the humerus, the point of the elbow, which is also called the olecranon, and then the ulna and radius are combined. There's a carpus, which in a horse, it's referred to as the knee. And then we have the third metacarpal, which is also called the cannon bone. And then the second and fourth metacarpals, which are called the splint bones. And those three are essentially fused together with a fibrous joint. And then we have the first phalanx, um, the second phalanx and the third phalanx, as well as the proximal sesamoid bones, and then distally, which you can't really see on this image, are the distal sesamoid bones as well. Okay, lots of differences, lots of differences, and we'll talk about these a lot in the lab. And then moving on to the front feet of a dog and a cat, so a carnivore front feet, this is your typical structure. And this is something that you'll want to get to know and be able to label. Now, why the heck do we need to know all of this information about front feet? Let me see if I can just check my battery here. I'm still good. All right. Why do we need to know how to label all these little bones of the front feet? What it comes down to for us as registered vet techs, again, is to be able to identify abnormalities. So for performing a physical exam, or a treatment on an animal and we see something abnormal, we need to be able to report it accurately. So we need to make sure that regardless of how many people are going to look at that medical record, no matter how many people are going to interpret it, they all have to be able to grasp the same information from that medical record. So they need to all be able to understand where that wound is or where you think it has a broken toe or where the toenail has come off. Going through this, so I won't be too specific about the carpal bones, okay? Don't worry about those too much. Um, if you'd like to get to know them, you definitely can. My main focus starts with the metacarpal bones. So if we look at our hands, if you put your hand flat out on the table in front of you, 
the if you if you do jazz fingers with your fingers if you wiggle your fingers around you'll see the long bones in your hand so between your wrist and your knuckles dancing around those are your metacarpal bones and in the hind foot or in the hind leg hind foot they're called metatarsal bones okay so dogs and cats carnivores have five metacarpal bones five metacarpal bones working our way distally next we have the phalanx bones. Well, we have sesamoid bones, which are those little bones that help um, create, uh, um, what am I trying to say, lubrication between tendons and bones, so don't worry about the sesamoids for now. But moving down from the metacarpal bones, moving distally, we have the phalanx, or phalanges is plural. So typically on most toes, there are three phalanges. So if you make a claw with your four fingers, you'll see three individual bones. If you make a claw with your thumb, you only have two specific individual bones. So how we label those, we've got phalanx, the, the first phalanx that we come across, and we're just going to talk about the four main toes to start with. So we have proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, and distal phalanx. Okay, if you're talking plural, proximal phalanges, middle phalanges, distal phalanges. Also called phalanx 1, phalanx 2, phalanx 3. So P1, P2, P3. Okay, we're getting there. P3 always holds the nail. Okay, so P3 is the most distal, so phalanx 3 is the most distal. It always holds the nail. The nail bed is coming away from P3. So let's have a look at how we number the digits and the metacarpal bones because they're the same. So the digits. So if we have a dog or cat that comes in, it's got a torn up nail and you need to identify which toe the torn up nail is on. Are you going to say the middle one? Well, they've got two middle ones. That doesn't make sense. So we actually have to number them. So how it works. We have digit one is the most medial and we work our way from medial to lateral. Digit one, digit two, digit three, digit four, digit five. Likewise, that's replicated with the metacarpal bones. So metacarpal bone one, two, three, four, five. Now, one thing that you should note, the most medial toe is called the dew claw. And what do we know about the dew claw? Well, what I know is that it's a heck of a lot shorter than the other toes specifically. So dew claws on most animals are on the animal when they're born. Some animals when they're born, um, somebody cuts them off. Um, there are various reasons for that. Some people say that it's likely if it has poor attachment because some dogs specifically have poorly attached dew claws, people get worried that it will get caught in the snow or the ice and be painful and rip off. I had a great Pyrenees. She had two sets of hind dew claws that were very, very floppy. It didn't happen. I know it can happen, so it's up to you sort of where, where your head goes with that. But I'm not one to take things off ahead of time. Anyways, that being said, dew claw. So the dew claw. Please note that the dew claw only has two phalanges. It doesn't have a middle phalanx. So it has P1 and it has P3. Now, how does this compare to the back foot, the hind foot? How does this compare to the hind foot? The hind foot only has four toes altogether. Some dogs, some cats have, an, have a dew claw on the back foot, but it's, it's rare. It's not as common. So most dogs and cats have four digits. Now, we always account for the fact that that digit at some point in evolution was there. So if it's a hind foot and we're counting, let's say it's this toe that the nail's broken and we have to tell the doctor which digit has a broken toenail and they don't have this dew claw, what number digit would this be? It would still be digit number two. It's like we've got to do a little throwback to the evolution that at one point there was a dew claw that was number one. So the first most medial digit that we see is still digit number two. And then digit three, four, five. Okay, lateral, and then medial. 
always account for the fact that it existed. Let's just do a little throwback here to the horse, equine. Okay, check out the horse. Look at the dog and cat. Pretty intense, pretty crazy. Look at the horse. So differences with the horse, again, radius and ulna are fused. And then these beautiful metacarpal bones, they have a second, a fourth, and a third metacarpal bone. They're fused together. Well, they're, they're fused together with a fibrous joint. And then they have phalanx one, phalanx two, phalanx three, but they only have one digit. So horses are always, always, always dancing around on their tippy toes. Okay, again, horses have one digit. So on the right, that's a vis that's vestigial, that's old, that's an old fossil of an old ancient horse where you can see that they had various metacarpal bones. Over time, over evolution, they fuse these metacarpal bones on a horse. So the main metacarpal bone number three is also called the cannon bone. And then the two supporting metacarpal bones, which are metacarpal bone two and metacarpal bone one, those are called splint bones. And then on a horse, we have to get really complicated. So P1, P2, P3, i.e. phalanx 1, phalanx 2, phalanx 3, also called proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, distal phalanx. Also on a horse, because they can't be simple, it's called the long pastern bone, short pastern bone, and the coffin bone. Good times. Can't keep it simple. This is cow, so they have two digits. Same idea, they have fused metacarpal bones, metacarpal bone three and metacarpal bone four, and then they have the three phalanges, um, but they have two digits specifically. Now this picture is nice because it illustrates the proximal sesamoid bones and the distal sesamoid bones in the horse and the cow. Um, up here, proximal, and then distal. And in the horse, we'll talk about specific names uh, that they have for those. So in horses, let's just skip back just because we can. Is there one more? Yeah. Okay, so in horses, right here, proximal sesamoid bone is also called... Oh no, it's out of my head. Oh, the fetlock, sorry. <laughs> Having a brain, brain gap. So it's also called the fetlock. And then the distal, which you can't really see, but essentially is right here, the distal sesamoid bone is called navicular. And they can get a lot of issues with their navicular bone. Um, it's essentially if they're overworked or whatnot, they can get swelling of the tendons and the soft tissue that surround the navicular bone. And it can cause a horse to go very lame very quickly. And it's often a very long course of treatment, uh, not always curative. So review, how many metacarpal bones do dogs and cats have in their front feet? What does the declaw process involve? What is a common name for metacarpal bone number three in the horse? And what is the common name for metacarpal bones two and four in the horse? And what's navicular? Navicular is that condition I was just explaining. Now I should go into detail. The one thing I did not discuss is a declaw procedure. So I talked about removing a dew claw from a dog or a cat. So declaw is another procedure that's done uh, most often in cats. I've only ever seen it done in cats. And I'm thinking that it's on its way out. Um, it's actually illegal in most countries except for Canada and the United States. Um, due to humane reasons. So declawing, what happens is they actually disarticulate the middle phalanx and the distal phalanx. So they cut away phalanx number three, which is a bone, and they toss it aside. So always keep in mind that cats that are declawed, it's not just cutting the nail back really far, it's not taking the nail off, it's actually cutting the ends of their toes off. So again, if you curl your fingers up like a claw, it's that last little bone that your fingernail sits on that would all be removed with a declaw. And some people still do it. A lot of people are changing the ways and not doing it anymore and rather educating clients about alternatives to declawing. And I think that's a really important aspect for us as RVTs to learn about the alternatives to declawing, to get really comfortable helping clients learn how to cut their cat's nails, talking about environmental enrichment, keeping their cats with lots of scratching posts, soft paws, etc. 
Because what they're finding now, as we get more in tune to chronic pain in felines, is that there is a lot of phantom pain. So chronic phantom pain associated with D-claws done 10 years ago or, or more even sometimes. And even if that's done really, really well by a really great surgeon, it's, you know, you have to remember that it's cutting the bones off of a cat's, it's cutting the ends of their toes off. So they're, they are finding that there's increasing rates of phantom pain uh, with kitties who have D-claws. Something to think about. All right, moving along, we're getting over to the hind limbs. So we've got, uh, we're going to start with the pelvis, which is a large structure made up of about six bones. So we have three pairs of bones. We have the ilium, which includes the wing of the ilium. The wing of the ilium is the dorsalmost process of the ilium, and that allows for massive amounts of muscle attachment. And then the ilium, the body of the ilium, essentially is what that arrow is pointing to. And then working our way down, about halfway down the hip socket, also called the acetabulum, is the hip socket, so the acetabulum. About halfway down the acetabulum, creating a bit of a T, is the pubis. So this area I'm outlining here, halfway through, is the pubis. Okay, so that's the pubis. And then we have the ischium is essentially when an animal standing, it is the most caudal aspect of the pelvis. So the ischium, and on the ischium, we have the ischial tuberosities, which allow, again, muscle attachment. So they're large processes that allow muscle attachment. The ischial tuberosities, you can see on a lot of dogs as well, and sometimes on cats, if you lift up their tail and just have a feel at the top of their thigh, essentially you'll start to feel their ischial tuberosities. On really emaciated animals, it's very predominant, which is really unfortunate. So going back, the acetabulum is where the head of the femur connects to create the hip joint. And then other unique features, we have this obturator foramen, or obturator foramen, however you like to uh, say it, pronounce it. And that is a hole uh, two holes essentially within the pelvis. Purpose of that, a lot of nerves and vasculature run through the obturator foramen and also it's in part to lighten the weight of the pelvis. The pelvis is giant. I'll show you a cow pelvis in class. It's really giant. It's really really heavy. So over time these holes have developed in part to lighten the load of the pelvis and also they allow for a lot of nerves to pass through. Sometimes animals can get into trouble with those nerves, specifically cows that have irregular births, um, long time with, a, with the calf being stuck in the birth canal. They can get nerve damage to those uh, obturator nerves that are running through. Another interesting point here is the pubic symphysis, not synthesis, so it's not like photosynthesis. It doesn't turn green with chlorophyll. Um, it's pubic symphysis, and this is a cartilaginous joint that allows just small amounts of flexibility of the pelvis. All right, working our way distally down the leg, we have the femur, and important points of the femur, we have the head of the femur, which again is very large, very specific, connects with the acetabulum to create that hip joint. We have the neck of the femur, the greater trochanter um, allows for muscle attachment on the lateral aspect of the hind leg. And then at the bottom we have the trochlea and the medial and lateral uh, condyles. So we'll talk about those in class. The canine tibia and fibula, note the spelling fibula, it's not fibia. So at the top here, we've got, or at the proximal aspect, we've got the patella, which is a small sesamoid bone, so patella. And then we have uh, the head of the fibula, the head of the tibia. One thing I'll point out in class is the tibial crest, which is quite beautiful, allowing for muscle attachment. Um, and that's a specific area I'll talk about in class. All right, now here's the hind feet of the canine and feline. So one thing that's really important to note are the metatarsal bones. So again, looking at the number of digits, there are only four digits, but we still count. Okay, if this is the medial aspect, we're still going to count for the missing, the missing uh, toe. So it would be digit one, two, three, four. 
okay, so four digit. But note that they don't have that metacarpal bone one, and they don't have digit one. Some animals do um, have hind dew claws, but it's fairly rare, somewhat rare. This is a really blurry picture identifying the hind limb of a horse. Really beautiful blurry picture. So again, it's identifying a couple things that are a bit different. The tibia and fibula are fused in the horse and cow. This is the calcaneus that we talked about earlier. By this, I'm saying this, calcaneus. And then again, they've got the splint bone, oh, which is the second and fourth metatarsals, as well as the cannon bone. They're fused together with a fibrous joint. And then we have the long pastern, short pastern, and coffin bone. So those are the common terms. The anatomical terms would be proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, distal phalanx. Here's a better illustration of the proximal sesamoids. So the fetlock, essentially this area is the fetlock, and then the navicular bone, which is the distal sesamoid. Okay, horses we really get into common terms and then anatomical terms. Visceral bones. Visceral bones are super cool. They are essentially embedded in tissue or organs of the animal. They are not attached to other bones, which is extremely rare. Um, they are extremely interesting. Rarity, it depends on the species. So some mammals have Oz penises. Dogs are a really good example that male dogs always have an Oz penis. And this is a bone that lies to the side of their urethra within their penis. The os cordis is a bovine um, bone that's within their heart. Certain species of bovine breeds, not species, certain types of bovine breeds have the os cordis in their heart to support the valves. And the os rostri is in some uh, pig snouts to support the snout during that rooting behavior. So while they're searching for things in leaves, turning up ground, etc. Now the os penis, I was totally under the impression, as in the textbook, that there are only a few types of mammals that have os penises, and I can't list them from the textbook off my head, but what I found out last year, thanks to a student, is that cats, they're finding also, some cats have os penises as well. So what they were finding is that in radiography, this is the study that was done, when a radiograph was taken of the cat, of the penis of the cat, it was sometimes being identified as calculus, so as like a, a urinary crystal or a stone stuck in the penis of a cat, and they were thinking that it's more of an obstruction waiting to happen. But instead, what they're finding out with better quality radiographs and digital radiographs is that some cats actually have tiny, tiny, tiny little os penises. Probably not that interesting to you. I was really interested. <laughs> so that's the study if you want to read it. Okay, moving along, we're getting out of here. Joints, the goals, know the common terms for the joints. Identify the commonly utilized joints on equine, bovine, and canine species, and classify the joints into one of the three types. I also want you to subclassify the joints as well. So the three types of joints, we've got fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. So fibrous do not allow for movement. Very firm fibrous tissue that unites two areas. The examples are the joints that unite the flat bones in the skull, and there are little sutures between that cut or that unite these bones and keep them solid. They do not move. There have been studies to prove that they do not move. There is a theory of thought that they do move slightly, but so far it's been unproven and that's to do with another <laughs> medical area. Um, also, fibrous joint example are the splint bones. They are attached to the cannon bone with a fibrous joint. Cartilaginous, they allow for slight movement. So very slight rocking movement is permitted. Example, the joints between the vertebrae and the spine, as well as the pubic symphysis in the pelvis and the mandibular symphysis in the mandible. Synovial are beautiful freely movable joints. So these are the ones that we really think about all the time in regard to joints. So the stifle, the carpus, the tarsus, the shoulder, etc, etc, etc. So the elbow, the big joints. Now another word for stifle for talking about humans, it's the knee. 
but for animals, always the stifle. Carpus and tarsus, for us, that's the wrist and the ankle. Shoulder is the shoulder. There are three key characteristics of synovial joints. They have an articular surface that's present on the surface of the bone, so it's present on the distal and proximal end of the bone. The cartilage is present on the articular surface, and there's a presence, I should just say presence, of a fluid-filled joint cavity called a fluid, or sorry, called a joint capsule. Now, articular surface means the joint surface itself. Okay, this is just a good picture of what a typical synovial joint looks like. So if you're ever involved in a synovial joint surgery or if you are taking fluid out of a synovial joint for testing, it's a sterile, sterile, sterile procedure because this is all very well protected. So the synovial joint is extremely well protected within the bursa, within the cavity itself. And you can see here, so here's the epiphysis of the bone. It has, this is the articular surface, so the joint surface of the bone. It's covered in articular cartilage, and that reduces friction. It allows for a smooth, um, smooth moving surface. And then it has this synovial cavity with synovial fluid, which again allows for lubrication, allows for low friction, um, in order to allow that point, to, point, that joint to move without any, any concerns. All right, we are so almost done. It's very exciting. So ligaments versus tendons. I just want to point out a few things because we'll go through them in class. So both are thick bands of connective tissue. Ligaments, they, bo they, boin. they join bones to other bones, and tendons join bone to muscle. So a good example I like to think of, cruciate ligaments are all within the knee, so within the stifle. There are various cruciate ligaments. Um, it's one that you'll often hear of dogs, quote, blowing their cruciate, i.e. blowing their cruciate ligaments, uh, whether it's the lateral, collateral, etc. Tendons, I like to think of your Achilles tendon, and that is the uh, muscle joining to bone. So this is the cruciate, this is the stifle itself. So that is, here's your tibia, not yours, it's the dog's tibia, the distal aspect of the femur, and that's the stifle, right? That's the knee. So these are all the beautiful, beautiful ligaments that connect the femur to the tibia and create the knee joint and allow for flexibility and extension. Now my big beautiful dog, Leia, was such a sweet dog. She had, oh, about 45 issues with her, but I loved her very much. She unfortunately blew her right cruciate first. So she blew her right one, and she had to have surgery, and she was this really big, sad dog for a really, really long time. But you can see it's all shaved. It looks like a little chicken leg. She had surgery, and she had an IV in there. That's all bruised, unfortunately. Okay, so they did a TPLO. Um, which is a surgery that changes the angle of the tibial plateau. So the tibial plateau, which you can't really see in this image. So they insert screws and plates to adjust for this level and ensure that she won't have um, a blown cruciate anymore. Now note with this x-ray, please note, this is also Leia. This is my big, beautiful, great Pyrenees dog. Note that she has two plates in. So she blew both of her cruciates. She blew one had it done, had it fixed, and then about six months later, she blew the other cruciate, so the other leg, which is very common because they're suddenly overusing that other leg and weakening all these little ligaments that connect those bones together. My poor big dog. And that's what it looked like from the side view. So this is the tibia, fibula, and this is the distal aspect of the femur. And there's the patella, and that's the flabella, and those are sesamoid bones. Did not stop her from digging holes. I know it's my fault, it's my fault, but she wasn't crate trained, it's all my fault, but she dug big holes and it was, I just let her do it, it was bad. Anyways, so that's essentially it and I don't know where I was going with that. I'll show you that one in class. Oh yes, this is an interesting image, one that I found on the web, just to show you some things that, again, you need to know the normals before you can know what an abnormal looks like. What the heck is wrong with this picture? This is a radiograph of a pelvis and the femur. So pelvis, femur, femur, vertebrae. Look at this poor animal has a broken pelvis, a severely broken pelvis. 
and then it's shifted as well. You can see the cubic synthesis is all shifted. So again, you need to know that when you take an x-ray, you can look at it and say, yeah, we took it, we got what we need, you know, show it to the vet feeling proud, knowing that you can see the anatomy, knowing which anatomy you needed to get in that radiograph. And then, of course, being able to look at this and not, <laughs> you know, being able to look at this and clearly see that there's something wrong, um, that it's something major going on and handle the animal appropriately. So some review, uh, list one example of each of the following joints, fibrous, cartilaginous, synovial. What's the significance of the obturator foramen? Provide an example of a hinge joint, a pivot joint, a gliding joint, and a ball and socket joint. Secret, those are in your textbook.